Testing. One, two, three. No, 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 no. Oh, shit. Hey, bud. <laughs> How's it going? Full house, jeez, that's good. Um, oh, we're gonna try to that. run a good railroad here because that's appropriate because we're actually dealing with the railroad down the hall and a little bit of that in a minute. Um, thank you all for coming uh, to this uh, installment of the College of Architecture and Planning's Emmons Visiting Professor Program for fall semester 2007. Uh, again, thanks for adjusting your studio schedule for today. Um, I, this is sort of in the middle of something. Sometimes we give lectures at the end of something or the end of an afternoon, and uh, Nate uh, wanted to actually provide this lecture uh, at this point in time because uh, many of you are going to continue uh, working on something this afternoon informed by what Nate is going to say today. So uh, a little bit of explanation about the, the time change a little bit. I would like to welcome uh, Nate Cormier uh, back to Ball State. Uh, Nate visited a few years ago. Uh, working with uh, students and community leaders uh, on a project that was about uh, uh, White River ecological corridor visioning process, which is, is kind of like the, the process that we're uh, dealing with for uh, the days of Nate's visit. This time, a slightly different location and, and focus, but uh, at least Nate has a little bit of familiarity with our community and CAP and the university. So welcome back. Um, Nate has a Bachelor of Arts in, uh, from Bowdoin College. He has a Master of Landscape Architecture from the Graduate School of Design at Harvard. Extensive professional practice experience at um, the noted firm of Jones and & Jones in, in Seattle and is now with uh, SVR Design Company in Seattle as well. Uh, Nate has uh, done the kind of things that uh, he's doing with our students uh, in other locations, the University of Sao Paulo, University of Washington, University of Oregon, uh, done green infrastructure uh, studio projects, which is, which is again what we're kind of doing uh, down the hall with uh, 70 students uh, for the next couple of days. This, uh, the topic he's going to talk about today, green infrastructure, it looks like something that he likes to talk about and has talked about extensively. Um, I was intrigued by one of the entries on his resume that um, talked about green infrastructure as uh, the new modern way of looking at landscape architecture design, and maybe there's a little bit of that in, in his talk today as well. Uh, for those of you who are participating in the charrette down the hall, and you may have noticed the chairs and tables down the hall, but for those of you who are participating, pay attention. This is your roadmap for uh, the next uh, few hours and, and days. For those of you who aren't participating in the charrette, you should know that we have uh, 70 students in four different studios at the moment working on uh, using green infrastructure as uh, a way to inform thinking about um, a uh, 
rail corridor that extends from Indianapolis to Muncie. So how can we use green infrastructure to guide growth uh, in our region, making a new Indiana landscape, thinking about green infrastructure? So without much more ado, I would like to welcome Nate Cormier to Ball State and um, appreciate your attendance. Hi, everybody. Uh, I don't need the intro slide because Malcolm pretty much told you my whole life story. Um, I'll work back from Bowdoin just so folks know I have a little bit of a Midwest connection. I grew up in Middleton, Wisconsin. And before attending uh, Harvard for graduate school, I studied with Bill Tischler and Phil Lewis and some of the other folks at the University of Madison. And so some of the uh, landscape issues uh, that you deal with may not be reflected in some of the case studies that I'm showing you from the Pacific Northwest, um, but I really do appreciate uh, in the charrette that we're working on and in our conversations uh, that there, is, there are subtle differences in the landscape here, and I'm excited to flesh those out uh, with you. So without any further ado, I am going to talk about green infrastructure. I'm going to describe this emerging uh, paradigm, why it's important. Uh, what its implications are for planning, design, and policy, uh, and fundamentally, what are the systems and elements that make up a network, um, multiple scales and uh, multiple layers that make up a network of green infrastructure. So get rolling with what it is. Um, if you were to Google it, which is pretty much what we all do whenever we hear a, a term uh, getting bandied, bandied about, uh, you'd, you'd get over 20 million hits right now. And the interesting thing is that a real uh, consistent definition hasn't yet emerged uh, because it's being used by folks to ref in the conservation community to refer to regional greenways that might connect you know, states, giant you know, basins and watersheds. Uh, and it's being used by designers, engineers, scientists, all the way down to individual molecules uh, in the soil and the impact that that has uh, on our environment. So uh, I think that's an exciting thing that there isn't yet just one definition because it really is uh, a paradigm which is about bringing those different scales and those different uh, perspectives together. So fundamentally, green infrastructure uh, is a way, a, a framework for recognizing the power that nature uh, has in our built environment. Uh, for example, in my city of Seattle, uh, below is the pre-development uh, condition of Seattle. Green infrastructure provides ecological services. Um, this is a a phrase you'll probably see popping up more and more, the Sustainable Sites Initiative uh, references ecological services as a kind of fundamental metric, a way of recognizing, measuring uh, what nature does for us in the built environment. Uh, services like uh, stormwater management, moderating microclimate, uh, sequestering carbon, and so on. And if we think about beyond the site scale to the health of regions, um, it's really about how we bring together the best of urbanism and the best of nature. You know, how we can attract people to compact, smart growth uh, communities, uh, but which still, as they densify, provide the services and amenities uh, and simply joy of being in contact with nature uh, that the natural environment provides. So how do you have this that functions like that is really, you know, sort of if there's a out there at the end of our, uh, um, our hopes and dreams, that's, that's really what we're after and, and lots of interesting challenges uh, to get there. So in its broadest sense, uh, green infrastructure is like a fabric uh, knit around uh, and through cities of open space uh, at this regional scale. This is King County. Seattle is here. This is the King County green print, which kind of gets at that conservation scale, thinking about green infrastructure. At the metropolitan scale, uh, as envisioned in the Open Space Seattle 2100 uh, charrette and then ongoing uh, process that's uh, been going on in Seattle, 
uh, you can see how the green infrastructure begins to shape and support development. It's really about the integration of those things at finer and finer uh, scales. And so it's really serves a preservation role and a support and infrastructural role uh, for that development. And, you know, I think we have to obviously recognize that this, these aren't brand new ideas. Uh, the, the phrase is being used a lot lately, but our earliest landscape architects, uh, Horace Cleveland in the Grand Round scheme, uh, Olmsted and the Emerald Necklace, they were already referring to those ecological services that these open space systems would provide in, and this is really critical, these were in growing communities. When the Emerald Necklace went in or the Grand Rounds, you know, the city was only like that. So we have to be thinking about where our growth is going and how we're anticipating uh, and shaping uh, a green infrastructure support system for those places. So specifically, physically, what are we talking about with green infrastructure? And I think it's important always to recognize that the foundation for uh, a healthy green infrastructure system is those preserved and connected natural landscapes. There's some debate within the green infrastructure movement as to whether we're talking about the ecological services that preserved forests and you know, big nature provides versus some of the engineered built environment LID, natural drainage system, those kinds of features. And so I think we need to recognize uh, that perspective that says, hey, it took you know, millennia for these kinds of systems to evolve to provide great complexity and great function, which we'll talk a lot about uh, in terms of the engineered systems that we're inventing. And of course, our traditional parks and gardens and trails and so forth, that was how we connected with the larger landscape, the larger preserved uh, landscape. But we can go further, and this is where the, the really the uh, emerging uh, opportunities are uh, for young landscape architects and for landscape architects to integrate with urbanists, engineers, architects, scientists. It's how we use green infrastructure to address other community challenges associated with flooding, drainage, water quality, food, uh, energy, uh, even protection from uh, natural and man-made disasters. And you know, thanks really to a generation of pioneers, I, you know, I'm only nine years out of my master's degree, and I was drawn to the Pacific Northwest because there was already a generation of, of folks uh, working on implementing the earliest pilot projects of many of these uh, techniques that I'm going to show you. And uh, in my own you know, growth as a landscape architect, I said, I want to go around and figure out what's working in all of those exciting projects that I keep seeing in the magazines or the latest books on uh, sustainability and identify the patterns that make up uh, the green, what come to call green infrastructure. And I'll just share a, a quote with you by a wonderful uh, architect with Miller Hull in Seattle. He says, the forms we conceive are really patterns and patterns are the configuration of relationships between natural systems. And he was referring to architecture, but I used that as kind of a mantra as I went out in search of patterns, in, in search of seeing within projects what their constituent uh, layers or systems and then uh, elements were. So that's really the, the meat of what I'm going to share with you is a kind of conceptual framework. Uh, it's not perfect, it's constantly in flux. I'll, I'll share with you later a way that you can help me uh, evolve uh, our thinking on this together. Uh, but it's really something that people can grasp easily uh, and ultimately implement uh, quickly in future projects. And I'll take as an example to explain the systems and elements, uh, the High Point project in West Seattle. This is West Seattle, I live up here. I go on my bike on the low bridge up to downtown around Elliott Bay. And just at, obviously at the High Point, up on the top of the hill, is a, a HOPE 6 uh, project. And I understand you have a, a recent HOPE 6 project in town here. And this was, uh, uh, World War II worker housing really falling apart. 
the decision was made to update it with kind of the new urbanist hope six approach of uh, mixed income, uh, mix of uses, different scales, all that good stuff. Um, but the neo-traditional pattern wasn't really protecting the water quality of this adjacent uh, Longfellow Creek. And so it was uh, an opportunity to add a, uh, some additional innovation to that approach to recreating uh, healthy communities. So this is that uh, the High Point neighborhood. And we can map its green infrastructure and recognize, oh, green belts along the corridor, uh, pocket parks, um, pedestrian-friendly streets, bioswales and things that all go to a wet pond. And we can peel those systems apart and examine them, you know, all the way back to design with nature. You know, Makar was layering and he'd kind of sift his layers in certain ways. And we don't want to oversimplify necessarily uh, things where complexity really matters. But I found in, in doing a lot of charrettes and studios and working with community groups that to the extent that you, I can give you like a certain number of markers that fit in one hand and keep it that simple, uh, we can communicate. Everybody's using a, a common uh, language. And so I, I worked hard here to think about, you know, which things could be gathered up together. And most folks would say, yeah, it wasn't, wasn't too dumbed down. And what we've come up with is a habitat system, a people place system, uh, a water system, and a mobility system. And I'll explain uh, each of those. But if you look at each of those systems, they're each made up of certain patterns or elements or components. And uh, so what I've done here, well, look at that, I have a second one too, <laughs> uh, is sift those uh, systems and recognize those patterns within each system into a kind of table of elements. And then that becomes a, a toolbox that you can deploy in a planning or design project. It's almost like your program. I've even done some exercises where you take uh, an existing landscape or a design project and you knock out all, okay, it's got that one, that one, that one, that one, and that one. And it's kind of like a little molecule that describes, uh, not unlike a pattern language, uh, what's happening for each of those projects. So let's begin with the uh, habitat system. That includes things like our urban forests, our wetlands, our shorelines. Uh, and it's important, I brought up metrics earlier, this, this issue of ec ecological uh, eco services. Sorry. And I think the goal in, in peeling these things apart it is to acknowledge that we need to be checking our plans and our designs for whether they're really increasing the health or success of these systems. And so for each of these systems, we can measure them with certain metrics. So habitat might be connectivity, biodiversity, interior species, uh, total area, uh, and so forth. So some examples, for example, the largest uh, urban wetland near Seattle is the Mercer Slough, uh, adjacent to Lake Washington. This is a pocket beach that is part of the Olympic Sculpture Park fantastic new project on our waterfront, which actually has a really innovative habitat feature just under the water surface, a terrace that's intended for uh, eelgrass, which is really critical in the life cycle of our juvenile salmon. And so, uh, you know, these are projects, there are people in them, you know. When, when I say it's a part of the habitat system, it isn't that, that these, these layers are ultimately being woven back together, but it's any feature which is preserved or created specifically or primarily with uh, wildlife habitat in mind. The second system is our uh, people places, our parks, our gardens, our backyards, our uh, you know, front yards, all those things. This is really the people habitat. This is where we live outdoors. This is if we were wildlife, these is, this is our habitat. And we can measure the success of these places uh, by the types of activities that people are able to engage in. Is there a place for you to uh, have your lunch outside? A uh, place to fly a kite? A place to walk your dog? Uh, can your kids play safely uh, near the home? So one example, a little park that I did in Seattle called Oxbow Park has a community garden where neighbors gather and produce their own food and really 
They've become the eyes on the park. That's a, a destination, a mini hub in, their, in the Georgetown neighborhood. This is uh, actually in front of my house. I, I, I was doing a mock-up of some gabion benches and walls for an, an environmental education center where I wanted to convince the client to let me do that. So I, I first had to convince my wife, of course, and broke out our rockery quickly while I had permission with a sledgehammer and rebuilt uh, this space. And aside from saying, hey, look at my house, uh, my point is to recognize the partnership between public and private investment that goes into a green infrastructure network. In microcosm, um, what I'm saying here is green infrastructure doesn't really care who the owner is, just like a drop of water doesn't care if it lands on private land or public land. Our systems need to link up across those boundaries. And so here I've just simply turned uh, a place that usually people just walk by into a place where they pause, have a seat, eat my strawberries and pears and apples and uh, I usually, they're pretty surprised when I get home and they're like, oh, I'm sorry. I'm like, no, 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 no. This is exactly what I was hoping you would do. Can I go take a picture of you? you know? <laughs> You're so real. <laughs> so the, the third system, the water system, I, I'll spend um, more time on this one. It includes things like rain gardens and bioswales and uh, all the LID, low impact development or natural drainage features that are becoming quite popular, but it really also includes our macro drainage, you know, our creeks and rivers, and that's all part of one whole system, and that's really something we'll be working hard on this afternoon in the charrette. Uh, and I'm, I'll, because these terms are getting used a lot, and, and our firm, SBR, this is one of our areas of particular expertise, I'll share some examples from around uh, the Pacific Northwest. Uh, and I realize some, you'll, some of the examples you may be like, oh, I already saw them in the magazine, but hopefully there'll be some new ones for you. And some of the diagrams that I've done are hopefully illuminating because when I was sitting in your seat, I was drawing bioswales on everything. And I didn't know what the hell I was doing. I was just like, yeah, there, one there, and one there, one there, one there. And as I've started working side by side with civil engineers, uh, I've really gotten under the hood and recognize that all of those features really perform quite different functions in very different ways. And so I want to illuminate a little bit of that for you. So the first one is a rain garden. And basically a rain garden is any closed depression where you send your uh, runoff either off of paved areas or from uh, other vegetated surfaces. And the fundamental thing about a rain garden typically is that most of the work is being done in the soil. So I might fill this up with all kinds of native plants and uh, there may be other features that are working in a different way, but when it gets to the rain garden, what you're really after is healthy compost amended soil uh, that acts as a filter. It slows the water, cleans the water as it goes through. All those microbes are chomping on all the uh, pollutants. Um, they've become very sophisticated in, in dealing with most uh, typical uh, urban runoff from roads. Um, depending on how much infiltration capability you have, you might need to underdrain it or overflow it once you reach capacity. Uh, you'll see some examples in Portland where they're lucky. They have really good draining soil. In fact, they need to really amend their soil to make sure the water goes through slow enough. And in Seattle, we're more challenged in that respect. And you'll see us using a slightly different palette of tools. So one example in Portland is the Glencoe Elementary School. All of this uh, runoff from the parking lot comes down and works its way through a series of uh, cells. They're good. Um, key to any of these systems is a sedimentation bay or basin initially to knock down all the, the big chunks of sand and dirt. That can be cleaned out periodically. What you don't want to have happen is that all that stuff goes out and clogs the pores in all of those uh, cells further along in the system. And they've done a really good job of interpretives here. They've worked with the school teachers to make the curriculum of some of the science classes related to those urban environmental issues. This is a rain garden at that same Oxbow Park in the middle of the uh, community garden area, taking a little bit of runoff from where they pull up the trucks. Also takes runoff where they wash their tools and fruits and vegetables and stuff. Uh, just pointing out. These aren't like when you're driving down the highway and you see the thing with the fence all around it and a gigantic, you know, one uniform slope boring. 
This is about taking this infrastructure and really injecting it into our public spaces, wrapping our public spaces around those infrastructural objectives. Um, we can't, as landscape architects especially, continue to sit back and let most of the investment in the public realm actually go to things that are hostile to the public. We need to, we need to marry those two things. This is one without any uh, vegetation in it because it's only taking runoff from the roof, so it's more of an infiltration garden uh, in the middle of the Maple Valley Library. Wonderful connection inside and out between the architecture and this just plain and simple uh, feature that it focuses on. So the next feature we'll talk about is a stormwater planter. And basically, this is just like a rain garden that's been squished into a, a compacted urban setting. And so you get your runoff from a building. I'll show you some examples that come bring road runoff. Uh, if there's a seal base to it, you're going to need to get that runoff uh, out from under it. There are some that also then go uh, to infiltrate. But we're seeing these more and more on rooftops. So instead of just the green roof, I'll show you a few of those too. But we're actually combining where, for example, over where a column lands anyway. And you've got extra structural integrity. Let's go, let's add more function there. So you can kind of step your uh, uh, features depending on that surrounding architectural context. So this is one that uh, we did on the Denny Park apartments, uh, edged with little kitchen gardens and then using the majority of the space. You're looking along one of the long, thin ones here uh, at the perimeter of the building. And so here you see those stepped different heights of stormwater planters and that's that uh, upper terrace. This is a low-income housing project as well. Here's one along the street taking runoff off the top of a parking garage. And so they did have, they park up on top, so there are some water quality issues up at the top, uh, taking it between the building and the sidewalk. You can also take it from between the road and the sidewalk and take road runoff. Who can tell me what's wrong with this uh, detail, though? Anybody? All right, Les, you can answer. It's OK. No? No? Anyone else? Basic. No? Although it looks like it's pretty deep there. It could be running out. Now, what would, what would happen if you parked there and tried to get out of your car? <laughs> so that was, this was the first one. This is the kind, we're really at that level of you know, learning some real basic common sense things with each one of these projects. So fortunately, the second one, time they did this in Portland, the big award-winning one that was uh, ASLA gave an honor award to, they solved that problem, finally, uh, and went with an even more compact and, and deeper box on these. This is a, a series of cells, and it runs in and runs out, overflows, fills the next one, overflows, fills the next one, and cleans runoff off of the streetscape there. Back up for a second. I am going to speak a little bit later about specific design impl implications, but just look at how compared to some of those earlier ones that were kind of loose and goosey, you know, early hippie wiggly ones, you can do this with any, you know, with aesthetics that fit in a more contemporary urban environment as well. And that's where some of the, the newer projects are going. So uh, next uh, typology, I'll talk about bioswales here. And unlike the rain garden, the fundamental thing to know about this, there may be some infiltration and some work being done in the soil, but typically we slope these things, you know, usually about 2%, so that it's the water moving across the surface and interacting with the vegetation. And we're literally studying now the resistance that different plants give to the flow of water for different heights. If it's going to be two inches of water, we want to make sure we have a six inch high plant so that if it gets blown over, it still provides enough surface area and bump and rub to catch pollutants out of that water and let the sun and microbes and, and air uh, decompose those things. So that's uh, for any uh, science types in, in the room or people looking for a more of a research-based uh, thesis, really getting to know plant palettes that work in your region. This is really regionally specific. If you want to have successful plants that can deal with water and drought and be uh, appropriate to your region, there's just a real dearth of information. Most of the evidence that's, that's been documented so far only relates to lawns from like Maryland or something. And we're all kind of extrapolating as best we can from that, but it's, it's a real uh, opportunity. Oops. 
lost one. So here's an example of a bioswale uh, a lot that takes parking runoff uh, at the New Seasons Market in Portland. This was one of the earliest ones. Uh, I, mean, I think it was 96 even. One of the projects that made me say I want to go out to the, the Northwest uh, in Portland at the OMSI, the Oregon Museum of Science and Industry, a Morassi project. Uh, this, this is an interesting use uh, with, with a bioswale underneath an area that wasn't getting any water. So they take the runoff from the parking lot and then green up an area that normally would have turned to dust bowl. Uh, so it gets kind of multiple benefits there. When I show this slide in Brazil, they're all going, ah, maybe we could use that to keep people from sleeping under our viaducts. So. And uh, some more details of High Point. These are the swales uh, along High Point. And you can see subtle, see the subtle weirs along the way there? The, the grass just bumps up. We try to trap little cells of water so we get infiltration into each of those. Uh, the reason for that is that this isn't your conventional swale system where it's primarily about moving across the surface. It's more like a series of swales that work, that we call it a bioretention swale. It's really more about like a, a bunch of uh, rain gardens that just happen to be long and linear like that. And so each one of those cells ultimately drops water. We didn't have very good infiltration here. So it drops it into a slotted underdrain pipe that eventually goes to a, uh, a larger pipe to a wet pond, which I'll show you when we get to that feature. So I'll zip through some, some more of that. When we've got more topography to deal with, there's some really elegant weirs and things. This is kind of an architectural or materials in the landscape that I think could use a lot more exploration. Uh, they tend to be pretty simple engineered things at this point, but why couldn't that be wide enough to form a walkway across uh, could be out of core 10, could be all kinds of cool stuff. Uh, another swale alongside the first ever porous uh, street in Washington. So this under drains out to the swale but provides a lot of detention and treatment on the way to getting there. Uh, and just illustrating, it really can take on lots of different uh, uh, visual ways there. I'm gonna zip, there's a lot of these, so I'll just keep moving, but at least give you the flavor. This is more of a built up, integrated with um, Miller Hull's architecture, a series of cisterns along the end of the building that overflow into a more built channel, uh, cascading down the side, slowing the water, cleaning the water. And then these are the what I call like a mega bioswale. What we're doing is actually taking uh, stormwater that's in a big pipe already. This one's taking it from a 600 acre catchment area open it up across uh, a filtering feature. So you open it up into a, a stream. It's like stream daylighting, but it's actually not down at the stream bed level. They actually just peel it out of the pipe further up and let it out and clean it and then drop it back down in the pipe uh, before it goes on and then emerges as Thornton Creek. This is right through uh, redevelopment of a shopping mall. If you've got the what, what we're now calling gray fields, you know, this was conventional 60s all parking, and they're using that now as the, they're turning their stores onto this amenity, and they're doing housing and housing over retail along this as a kind of park, even though it's a, a really major part of our uh, stormwater treatment system. And happening now in more urban areas on what we call this the Swale on Yale in Seattle. If anyone's been to Seattle, where the REI is in South Lake Union, it's our big booming uh, kind of hip new neighborhood. And, uh, along that corridor, and uh, we're going to open up um, a pipe that's got all of Capitol Hill's water, 240 acres, and clean it on several blocks uh, on Yale. So wet pond, which I referred to earlier, this is something we're real pros at in Seattle because we don't have such good infiltration. So oftentimes we do need that larger feature at the end of the system uh, to help us out. So we had flooding along uh, Thor later on Thornton Creek. This takes overflow that was going into the neighborhood off the creek into a completely constructed pond system. This is where it goes in. There's the overflow underneath the viewpoint. Uh, and you know, you, this was all um, you know, parking lots and things before. So really providing a fantastic community and habitat amenity uh, in, for the neighborhood. Lots of art integrated with it. Another very artful uh, series of wet ponds that are part of a larger stormwater project uh, in Renton, Waterworks Gardens. This one, I'll just point out something that I find fascinating. 
So, you know, I'd seen all the pictures in LAM when I was a student, and I know the artist very well now, and she's brilliant. But I went there, and I couldn't see anything. And so this is really an interesting question for us as designers, trying to demonstrate, trying to, to show function if this subtle grading is so important uh, and we're dealing with these environments that are just inherently mucky and, and great in their richness, you know, they tend to turn into stuff like this. And depending on what kind of uh, uh, urban context you're dealing with, you know, that wouldn't work in Brazil. They would be really concerned about, you know, somebody hiding there, or somebody moving in there. Um, but I'm thinking about just as an artist, I'm thinking, I want people to know that that happened. You know, I want to be, so I think that's another area, another, the plants folks in the room are really jazzed about that. Figure out which plants can provide the function, yet still work aesthetically with your other objectives. So then this is the one that's down at the bottom. I showed you that diagram of high point, all those swales ultimately going down to a wet pond uh, that forms kind of the central park or the, the largest park in the neighborhood uh, with a trail around it. A little too much grass for my taste, but you know, you, you try to get a few successes on each project. Green roofs, I, I'm assuming folks have seen lots of these, so I'll, I'll go relatively quickly through some extensive, uh, uh, all of these are extensive, which generally refers to a thinner, lighter profile versus an intensive. Uh, one we did on the Seattle Municipal Courthouse and the adjacent City Hall. Um, this is one that shows kind of the interesting, what I was talking about earlier about being able to use different thicknesses of green roofs depending on uh, what's happening structurally with the building. Again, integration, integration of disciplines so that you can achieve the greatest function and performance in those landscapes and in that architecture. 30 inches of bioretention there versus two, six, six. So it's really an opportunity for cascading benefits there. My own little experiment with a green roof there at Oxbow. <laughs> Cisterns. Um, I'll show this one and then I'll say why I think they're terrible for Seattle. Because <laughs> there's some really, this is a really cool one uh, called Growing Vine Street that has a, the beckoning cistern by Buster Simpson. Brings water off the roof there and goes down through a series of um, kind of uh, backed up cisterns there. Really, you know, just gorgeous cascades and everything. But the cistern itself, and here's another one at a community center, left it exposed. They wanted to be able to flush toilets. So they needed a humongous one. We don't get in the summer very much rain at all. And in the winter, we get kind of just steady, light rain, you know, or mist. We don't even own umbrellas. I know that's probably hard to believe. But uh, so this is something that all the greenies like us want to like, oh, we want to show you we can do cisterns. We want to show you we can do cisterns. But really, when you think about it, there should be a green infrastructure palette that's regionally responsive. And just as we're starting to really excel in wet ponds, and whoop, Portland is starting to excel in those other types of more infiltration features, I'm guessing cisterns are going to be more popular in places that get those big summer thunderstorms, where with a smaller feature, you can actually have a lot more impact. And so places like Texas are actually on the vanguard of, uh, of cistern design and, and water reuse in general. So then the last system is uh, mobility. And so this is things like our trails and our, uh, uh, I don't know if folks are hearing about complete streets, thinking about streets for multimodal you know, transit and buses and all that. If you're doing the TOD thing, I'm sure you've been hearing plenty about uh, complete streets as well. Uh, Voonerfs, I'm working on my first Voonerf, which I'll show you. Uh, this is a, a trail underneath a power line in Seattle. This is one that we did actually using the spoils from a big tunnel, light rail tunnel project. And, as they would deliver the spoils, we would have to design another couple hundred yards of it, uh, one segment at a time. Um, but just really pointing out there are lots of linear systems in your communities that can become those key connections. So don't just think about, oh, we've got to build you know, a standalone trail. There's a lot of linear systems. If you just look at the landscape with fresh eyes, you'll see those opportunities emerging. Uh, an exa some examples of complete streets. And then uh, first Voonerf that I've been working on, and that's a Dutch term for a very pedestrian-friendly street, where instead of having to use curbs to say this is for pedestrians and this is for cars, you really treat the whole surface as a pedestrian environment and use other kinds of cues, shift changes in materials or uh, bollards or something else to say, hey, cars don't drive into the cafe. 
but you know you just make it feel like pedestrians can circulate back and forth across there so this is a new commercial uh, hub that will anchor the other end of Yale from where REI was at the other end of that swale on Yale actually so you can take those systems and then bring them back together to form these green infrastructure networks in a community and ultimately around connecting that community to the larger landscape. And any investment, if you're hearing about a, uh, a pipe project somewhere, a road project over there, any of those things need to be examined for those multiple functions that they could be providing. It's usually the case that a little bit more money or some partnership amongst departments could have achieved a much more successful project once we break out of that kind of silo mentality of each department spending on their capital improvements with only one objective in mind. So now the implications uh, quickly for planning and design and policy. I'll spend the most time on the planning scale just because this is kind of the exercise that we're going through. I'll use examples from the Open Space Seattle 2100 process and the Lake Forest Park legacy project uh, which is actually using an earlier version of these kind of four systems as its organizing principles. Lake Forest Park is, is just to the north around Lake Washington from Seattle. And the first step is really educating the public. Um, and in the case of Open Space Seattle 2100, we brought in, brought in lots of fantastic thinkers about uh, infrastructure, about the way people use public space, about sustainability, and just build a kind of climate of interest in the subject so that we're not showing up with a brand new term on our, on our tongues and folks are kind of like, whoa, I'm, I don't know what that is and I've got other really important things to do. If they've been to a couple of lectures ahead of whatever big planning push, if we're talking about the Indiana Green Line, let's get some folks in here who are leaders in all the different aspects of it and have them getting your public excited leading up to a more significant planning push. And part of that education is linking what you're doing to issues that matter in the community, uh, connecting it to other legacy uh, opportunities. For example, in Seattle, we had an Olmsted Brothers plan that was just about 100 years old. And that led us to say, well, what do we want in 100 years? If they were thinking about this 100 years ago, and here's where we're at, uh, and you look at it, I mean, bam, they were already looking at greenways and connections and uh, really a lot of the same principles that we're getting at. Uh, we have to ask ourselves, set, set an equally high bar for our, the way we look into the future and link it to the pressing issues of the day, be it global issues like climate change or local issues like growth. Uh, the red outline shows Seattle as its, uh, Seattle's metropolitan area as it currently stands and all that other globby stuff is uh, the anticipated sprawl, should we do nothing? Should we leave our policies precisely the way they are? This is how it will build out. And so what can we do in light of these uh, and knowing we have a legacy that we're proud of and want to build on, how do we set the stage in that way uh, for a planning process? And one of the next fundamental steps is choosing your units, your planning units well. Uh, in the case both of Lake Forest Park and Seattle, we really got everybody to focus on basins or watersheds as the fundamental planning unit. And uh, for regional projects, that usually makes sense to people. Everybody gets it. You're in the same basin. But in urban settings, it can be uh, quite a challenge to get folks who are used to thinking of themselves as the top of the hill neighborhood, go into community council meetings with the same people, same business, business group, all those kinds of things to start working across their basin with folks who might be down the hill from them, might have a different social status, a different context on the city, but when you show them that there is that intrinsic or underlying uh, thing that they share, that they have in common, it really uh, creates new partnerships that they hadn't reached yet before. And it also suggests an equitable way to distribute the kinds of investments. If we're going to raise a levy for green infrastructure, which is the outgrowth of Open Space Seattle 2100, that's what uh, a coalition of organizations is advocating for, we're going to push to spread the wealth, uh, catalyze projects in those different basins so that it's equitably distributed. And the, the basin model really helps us with that. And of course, basins can be thought of at all different scales. This is all of Washington. This is all of central Puget Sound. This is all of 
uh, Elliott Bay around in my house, in my work. Um, you can really nest the concept depending on the scale of inquiry of your planning exercise. And each of those relates to the next scale up and down. And you tackle different issues. You, you kind of, like I think the folks who are in the charrette today, you got a planning thing that's you know, 10 miles long and it's only, it's only this big on the paper. You know, you're probably not diagramming every little bioswale. You know, you're looking for the big moves. And so you have to kind of calibrate uh, the way you look at the landscape and plan the landscape depending on how much area you're tackling. So I just want to also point out those units really work well along linear corridors, a greenway, uh, a river. This is the uh, Rio Chiete in uh, Sao Paulo. This is uh, the Paris-Lexington Road uh, from uh, out of Lexington out to Paris in Kentucky. And again, you know, in this case, these are reaches and runs along the river. In this case, these little guys are the basins along that road. So the road is still the thread, or the green line, the train, is still the thread. But by getting people to acknowledge the intrinsic landscape that underlies what's unique about each of those, you build a constituency for each of those uh, pieces along the corridor, and that's important. So the third step is you know, discovering the anatomy of the landscape. When you think of those four systems, what's there? You know, we went, that was the first thing we did today in the charrette was really, this is a, a fancy way of saying what are the existing conditions, but really engaging people, asking provocative questions, having them map with you uh, what's there and then what's missing, what would make each of those systems whole. One of the exciting things we did with the Lake Forest Park project was after we had a big uh, green infrastructure festival to get people excited about it, we actually uh, mashed up our GIS work with Google Maps, and folks were able to go in and put thumbtacks and tell us about features. And you know, we had maybe 200 comments from a, a three-hour session on a Saturday. We got 1,000 comments from a city of 10 or 11,000 people in one week by opening up our planning process to that easy uh, and, and interaction. And then, of course, this is the fun part. This is what we're doing for the next three days, uh, is developing that long-term vision. This is uh, the Green Futures Charette for Open Space Seattle 2100. We had 350 people, predominantly professionals or folks in the allied disciplines. Uh, and we did that for three days. And both looking at the big scale, whole city, our basin, and specific uh, projects. And you really just work it that simply, you know, watershed by watershed, organized in basin teams, checking out what's happening at the seams between your basin and adjacent basins, uh, and then just bringing it up system by system and then seeing how they work together. How do the trail systems relate to the habitat corridors? How do the destinations relate to your uh, mobility system and so forth? And then this was the result of putting all those basins together in GIS uh, had even different terms then, right? Habitat, uh, parks and community, urban centers, water infrastructure, and so forth. Putting all those together into a 20-year vision and a 100-year vision. And this is then the same exercise, uh, digitizing and putting together the six basin uh, charrette team results. And one critique we had after we got to this point was, you know, it's still a bit of a Jackson Pollock. You know, it's still, okay, if that's a 100-year vision, there's like a thousand things going on. Like it's a little bit, uh, you know, you take a deep breath. Like, well, where do we start? It's, it's intimidating. And so one of the, the key things is still to get from your, uh, the big messy good stuff to clearly articulated planning concepts. And this goes right back to, you know, your Phil Lewis's and your, core, your, your uh, landscape ecology of, you know, corridors and hubs or, you know, what are, what are urbanists call it? Districts and uh, uh, nodes and, you know, all the, so the, everybody's getting at like point, line, and plane, but uh, you still need to get to that kind of simplicity after having figured out what makes up the complexity that is in those, uh, those broader forms. So we have a lakeway, main stem creekways, tributary creekways, a loopway, uh, the hub, hublets we call these guys, and then gateways. So there's still kind of a, a planning, uh, typical planning process that needs to kind of give a, a body, give a skeleton to that green infrastructure system. And then, this is the part we're going to do at the end of today, you have to identify, this is the final step, uh, by the way, is 
in the planning process, identifying the catalytic projects. Half the battle is doing something cool somewhere. The other half of the battle is being smart enough to know where to have done something cool and to have picked a place that's doable enough that it's you know, feasible and realistic, but not so easy that you don't raise the bar, you don't take anybody anywhere. So you need to look for projects that provide a, a, a decent level of challenge, that are highly visible, uh, and that impact as many of those systems as possible. So again, we put it online and we equitably distributed potential projects. We said, if that's your 100-year vision, here's your comp plan horizon. Here's, in 20 years, we want you to have done these projects. Uh, and we're going to go to the community and say, which are the ones that should go straight into like a capital, we say capital improvement project budgets. And that in Washington, that's on a six-year horizon, planning horizon. So we wanted priorities from folks on which projects, you know, and you could, you could just roll over or click on them and, and see the details of each one. And I'm just going to blast through these. Mostly I just, I'm, not, I'm only going to show you five or six of them. But I want you to show you how for each of those projects, we can identify uh, how it's impacting, what its contribution, what its, uh, uh, how, it, how we can measure the health of the systems that are impacted by particular projects. So I just picked some random ones. One that uses a right-of-way for a trail, uh, confluence of two important creeks, new parks, uh, taking out half a road to make a trail along a really, you know, one of the most beautiful places in Lake Forest Park, which a certain comment just captivated us when we saw this. Someone said, this is the most beautiful road in Lake Forest Park, and we risk our lives every day to enjoy it. And so they were worried about this thing falling down into the creek and led to some kind of, we think, win-win solutions for improving that. Gateways, uh, potential for sea streets or uh, bioswales and things along some of the residential routes to the school. Schools as really critical places for early action successes, places where they're going to get a lot of visibility, especially with the next generations. Uh, critical habitat locations with, or for public access to the shoreline. Uh, okay, so the, now shift gears. What if you don't have six months? What if you don't even have a capital improvement project? You don't have departments waiting for your answers? Uh, then you gotta you gotta be a little bit guerrilla style about it, and that's what Open Space Seattle 2100 was, and that's what the Indiana Green Line is gonna have to be. The things you guys cook up need to be so compelling, so inspiring, even absurdly, uh, uh, outlandishly, uh, heroically difficult to accomplish, but that make people say, "Wow, why not? You know, why can't we have that?" That's not gonna be in the capital improvement project budget that you put a big. Uh, bay back through downtown Seattle, uh, actually through the underutilized uh, south downtown, but there might be projects that we can propose that are those catalysts, they're the seeds that get us to the big vision. So we're really counting on you guys by, the end, by Friday to have developed some really fantastic uh, projects that, that the folks who are uh, be actively pushing the, the green line to go forward, that they can use those uh, to inspire people. So I'll close with just a few slides about these issues of what are the implications for design and policy. Uh, this is related to design. I've been using an expression uh, that I think is uh, really getting some traction amongst folks that are sick of the old dichotomy between art and ecology. You know, I, when I was going to college, they were still hung over with the Pete Walker versus the Ian McCarg types, and I'm using GIS, and so I'm not a designer, and I'm using, you know, paper mache, and so I'm not a planner, or whatever folks were doing. And I think our generation is really, that's, that really doesn't matter anymore. The most exciting aesthetic opportunities are related to the ways we can heal our environment. And the most compelling environmental opportunities are the ones that are going to captivate the public, that are going to get traction. We can't just mandate that there's a bioswale on every street. Uh, that we'll talk about some policy moves that where people are getting to that point, but to get there, you need to inspire people, and that's our responsibility as designers to give form to these functions uh, in a new modern landscape with this aesthetic of performance. And I, I, I compare it uh, frequently to what architects went through at the dawn of, kind of international modernism. They were casting off the Beaux Arts. You know, they peeled away all the the decoration that really was, at that point, out of control, uh, and asked themselves, 
What is the most authentic? What is the most uh, true expression of the structure that I'm creating, of the inhabitation, of its relationship to its climate? And new signatures of that emerge, the piloti or the brise soleil. The architects had to understand what was happening. What was the latest innovation in concrete technology, in aluminum, uh, glazing? They really had to know their materials, their systems, and they had to basically embed themselves with structural engineers. And I, uh, I argue that we're at a similar uh, point in time with landscape architecture, that as landscape architects, we need to know those systems. We need to work closely with civil engineers, with ecological scientists, to bring uh, authentic and expressive forms, new forms. Sometimes they might even be ugly. We don't know what they're going to be yet. We're still finding our voice as designers with these media and peeling away, you know, Martha Schwartz isn't in the room, is she? Okay. <laughs> this is the horrible thing she did in front of our jail. And uh, you know, if I see more pastel tiles ever again in my life, I think I'm, I'm done. Um, you know, I think we're over the polemic of saying, I can do this because the city is nature too. You know, our generation can say, yeah, the city is nature, but we still want clean water and we want clean air and we don't want to you know, live in an overheated earth. And so what can we do that's elegant that is also functional? And so I use as one of my favorite projects is one by uh, Atlas in Portland, uh, the Stephen Epler dorms. Just such a simple way to connect this building to the landscape. I mean, any architects out there, go grab a landscape architect and say, how can I really root my building in the land? That's always been a preoccupation of the greatest architects. And when you can functionally, literally stitch it to the ground with one of those systems, you really can, uh, visually and functionally give people a sense of a rootedness of that architecture. So the water comes down in a rock pocket there, uh, moves across these uh, very nice stone uh, little runnels, and then into these uh, stormwater planters that are all linked up in series that have seat walls around them. Just very simple, elegant details, a lot of function, a lot of uh, contextualism. And uh, when I stress the modern, I don't really care at all about the formal, the former formal consequences of modernism. I'm speaking to that, that uh, curiosity about the latest technologies and materials and partnership amongst disciplines. It's not the brise soleil and the piloti that I want someone to copy even when they're no longer dealing with the climate or doing anything underneath the, the elevated space. You know, it's, we don't want to grab the, the carcass of modernism. We want to seize the, the life of it. And the exciting thing about green infrastructure is if we focus on hydrology, geology, that's the things that are true and intrinsic to a place in order to function better, in, in order to bring about greater health, we are inherently going to be expressive of our regions. Very different from a modern sensibility that says, I've got this really cool form that I do, and I'm going to show up in your town, and I'm going to give you these great landforms, or this you know, cool, everything pink and plastic, or whatever the, your vision of radical uh, visual uh, aesthetic is. Instead, it's going to say, I'm going to show up, and I've got a lot to learn about what works here. And working with people in a place, I'm going to discover what works, and I'm going to strip it to those bones, and we're going to have a raw, brand new aesthetic that's expressive of your uh, natural conditions. And so that, I think that's a really uh, intriguing way to think of uh, uh, a, I think what was the phrase that was used in the late 80s and 90s, um, critical regionalism was a kind of a buzzword. And I think this gets at that synthesis of some universal principles that still need to be dialed in uh, to the unique qualities in each place. And I think a great example of that is the Portland Convention Center's rain gardens takes a, you know, four hectares or three hectares of uh, roof runoff into a very elegant uh, series of, of rain gardens where they, you know, this is really expressing the materials that are, are the volcanism of that region, the native plants that work, you know, in that microclimate. And so giving a, a, a signature experience that would only be appropriate in this place, but at the same time is also extremely functional. 
And then finally, uh, policy implications. This is what we call uh, establishing the new normal, although someone just told me, I think some guy was on Oprah talking about that after 9-11. I was like, oh no, it's already been done. But anyway, what we're getting at is we need to study those pilot projects. We need to see what works, what doesn't work, and start implementing this beyond those one-off projects that we do and figure out how to make them the new normal for our infrastructure, for our investments as, uh, as civic, as citizens, as governments. And this is a great example in Seattle, modeled on uh, a program in Berlin called the Green Factor, where we give credit to uh, these landowners for different, they get certain points for each type of green uh, landscape or green roof or green wall that they implement on their project. And they're required to get their permit whenever they make a change or they do a new development to meet a certain threshold of greenness. And to, in order to increase the visibility of it, we allow them to get their points in the public right-of-way. Again, blurring that distinction between the private lands and the public right-of-way in order to have the most benefit for the public. So if this guy just builds a great courtyard back there, in most communities, that would, he would have, and even on the roof, he or she would have satisfied their open space requirement. And, and even if they put a little, sometimes someone is so sad, so weak, he could do a little indoor gym or something, and that's like some kind of amenity that somehow in some abstract way the public is benefiting from. Instead, we're looking to encourage those features that contribute the most to the public realm. And uh, I'll, I'll end on, really what I think is the most successful implementation at a policy scale, and it's really another kind of scale. There's planning and there's design, and what links those, the kind of right ideas at the planning scale that's going to happen in many, many, many designs is the policy. This is uh, Portland's Green Streets program. They had done so many of these wonderful infiltration features, and they were finding it worked so well, and they did cost-benefit benefit analyses that, that showed that this was uh, actually saving them money that they now force the uh, transportation officials to prove that their project cannot be done with natural drainage before they can go to traditional catch basins and piping it away. So this is really, this, this, I'm, I'm letting my Portland envy show. Um, Portland, Vancouver, and Seattle are always like, well, they've got this, and they've got this. And then you go down there, and they're all raving about something we did that I'm like, oh, that, we're so sick of that, we want what you have. Um, so anyway, so that's, Establishing the new normal, looking really at how the, the things we're planning today, the things we're designing tomorrow, what are the uh, patterns within those that we can implement uh, across the board. So once again, I'm Nate Cormier, and I'm with SBR Design. That's my email, and I love any questions that you have uh, going forward. And uh, I promise to tell you how you could really help with this effort. Um, it really is, isn't something, I can't be the ex- only Meg can be an expert on so many different uh, things at once. But uh, the, to know enough about any one of these systems to be an expert would be impossible. And so we're building a network of professionals and students from around the world that are all, a Dutch guy wrote our Wunerf page. I was blown away. I was like, wow, that's like so right. <laughs> uh, and so there are examples. Uh, it's organized both by element within systems and then there are also case studies, and they're cross-referenced, because any good project should illustrate many different, contribute to multiple systems. So you can look at a project and see which elements are in it, you can look at an element and find out which projects, maybe one near you, uh, demonstrate that. So thank you very much, and I'll stick around and answer any questions you might have. We're not going to feed you until you ask a question. <laughs> they made me do it. <laughs> okay. Is it on? A lot of the examples you showed us were in larger cities. Have you seen this movement happen in any smaller towns like Muncie or even smaller? And what are you seeing? That's a towns that's do? a great question. We actually SBR is getting a lot of requests from smaller communities. Um, part of it is that in the state of Washington, our uh, stormwater co code was recently upgraded. The Department of Ecology has a 2005 manual, and many communities are asking 
hey, all the pilot projects were done in Portland and Seattle, but what about us? Can we, can we adapt that toolbox to be more applicable to our setting, our streetscapes? Uh, and so there are more and more examples being done, mostly at a policy scale. I'll tell you, they, they're jumped in a way because the, the pilot projects have been done and the codes are now already uh, pretty well written, they're moving straight into how can we make this, instead of uh, building our next highway this way or allowing another subdivision to be done that way, how do we just go straight to insisting on these development standards? So one good resource for that is the Puget Sound Partnership, and they have an LID manual. They really, they like to use the low impact development term. And so especially for the stormwater, they are, uh, they offer grants to small communities to, it's obviously only in Puget Sound, but they, they'll, you'll see the discussion amongst the larger and smaller communities and, and how that's playing out. Uh, we're working in public down there in the, first floor atrium, so come find me um, in the next couple of days if you have some other questions, and I'm sure there are more, but I also am sure that you got some things to do in studio otherwise. Come up and say hello and ask a question up here if you'd like, or come find Nate uh, sometime today, tomorrow, or uh, Friday morning. Thanks a lot for coming again, and thanks to Nate for a great lecture. Get back to work. <laughs>